myself. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, 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 good. Cool. So I feel like I haven't been up here in a while, but I pastor came up to me last week, and he was like, you're going next week. And I was like, cool, because I wanted to. I was going to ask you, because I've had this, this message has been put on my heart for, I don't know, what seems like two or three weeks. And usually what happens when something gets, you know, a message or anything like that that I get, like, from two or three weeks ago usually doesn't become what I end up preaching about because it gets changed or, you know, the Holy Spirit has a different way for it. But I, the more I kept studying it, the more that it just kept sticking with me. And, and I was here, I was like, okay, this is, this is what I have to talk about. And it's about trusting God. And I think it's something that it's become a lot, for some reason, a lot harder for Christians to do, especially like Christians these days. Because we can look back in the Bible and be like, oh man, those great men of God, they trusted God, no problem. They had, you know, just no, re- they're, they're, they didn't have so, much, so many things going on in their life that would distract them from trusting God. And we're really good at excuses. Like that's, like I think like, like if you look, I don't know, I, I feel like that's like this generation. And I don't even just mean like, people my age, I just mean literally everyone alive is good at excuses. Like, we're really good at excuses. That's like our, uh, our, our claim to fame is excuses. And I was sitting there, and I was wondering why, you know, Pastor and Rowena and Charlie and everyone's coming up here, and they're giving all these great words, and it doesn't seem to be sticking with anyone. And I was like, why is that? And it was because we don't trust the word. We don't trust what God has to say. We don't trust the direction that he gives us. We feel like we know better. So I had to look up what trust was, because I think we all have a definition, but I feel like all of our definitions are scarred by people who we did put trust in, and then they broke that trust, so we don't really know what trust means. So I, I Googled it, because Google's great, and the first definition that came up was firm belief, and I, right there I had to stop, because I was like, most people aren't firm in their belief. They want to believe, they occasionally believe, they sometimes believe, but they're not firm. Something that's firm is something that doesn't break, something that holds, some, and not only is it something that holds, but something that holds itself together. Like it's self-fulfilling, it's self-truthful, and that's like what God is and what the word of God is. There's not, like God proves himself and his truth is proven by his truth. That might seem really complicated, but the more you read the word, the more that actually makes a lot of sense, a lot of sense. It doesn't seem that complicated, but it probably seems complicated because you're not reading enough of the word. Just saying. It says, a firm belief in the reliability Boom, right there. No one's reliable. Can't trust no one. Can't rely on no one. Every time I ask someone for something, they don't do it for me. I'll do it for them, but they don't do it for me. Right? Right, right, right there, we already start arguing with the definition. We're already like, that's not trust. Like, okay. It says, firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. I wanted to cross off something, but I had to put it in there because it was the definition, but I like where it says strength of someone, because a lot of times we try and make God a thing and not a living being. I mean, granted, he's not like human like us, like we don't see him, but he is a living being. He is a spiritual being, and we have, we, we distance ourselves from God so much that we like put him way up here or way over there, or we don't, like we don't rem- remember that he like walks with us like daily, like he's always there. I mean, it depends though. I mean, if you're out from under his covering, you're not really in God's presence, but that doesn't mean God's presence doesn't abide daily, right? And so, and then the next definition was a hope or expectation. And I was like, ooh, that's good. We don't have that in God. We don't have any expectation for him to do anything. We pray and then we just like question what we prayed or we doubt what we prayed. We don't believe in what we prayed. Or we hear all these promises and we're like, oh, that sounds great, but I don't think that I'm going to get it. Or I don't think I'm good enough to deserve it. Or I don't think that God's ever going to bless me like that. That's only for pastor because he's super spiritual and I'm just sort of spiritual. That's not the case. It's, God's blessings are for all of us, okay? God's promises are for all of us. Also, God's curses are for all of us. But the problem is we live so wrong sometimes, that's all we're getting. So we think that all we get is God's curses. We don't, like, expect ourselves to be able to obtain his blessings, and we don't put that pressure on ourselves, and we don't put that 
responsibility on ourselves to change our lives, to change our ways, to grow and to mature and to become more spiritual and more in tune and touch with him so that we may receive his blessings. And it shouldn't be, I'm going to do this so I can receive his blessings, but those are definitely a byproduct a, a by, a by of serving him and serving him truthfully and serving him spiritually and serving him righteously. And that's something else that we miss too is righteousness. Because, I mean, righteousness, it sounds like this really big word and like, I didn't understand it at first, and then I think a pastor probably explained it to me. But righteousness is having right standing with God. And it's like, well, what do you mean by right standing? Like, he likes me or something? No, that's not what it means. It means you follow his words and his commandments and his laws, and you stand up for what's right. You do what's right. Like, when you are in a situation, it's not like, in, okay, take for example, you see someone stealing something from the store. Like, the right thing to do would either be to tell someone, hey, that guy just stole, like, tell the proper people, don't, don't be an idiot and be like, he's stealing! Like that, you make yourself look like a fool. Make everyone else look like a fool. But how many of us probably have seen someone do that and we don't say anything? Or we've seen someone do something wrong and we're like, that's not my problem. I don't have to say anything about it. I don't have to do anything about it. I mean, I was next door on Sunday, but I came over for like 15 minutes, and it was funny because there was like, it was, it, what really cracked me up was it seemed like the members of El Shaddai seemed more resistant to the message than the visitors. I was only over here for 15 minutes, and I came in like later on in the, in the message, so I was like, dang, they've probably been sitting here for like 45 minutes, getting heck of mad at pastor. <laughs> getting heck of frustrated, don't want to hear it, don't want to know what's right, don't want to change, don't want to have any responsibility. And I was like, that, and I hate to say it, but it's people that are like older than me. And then they want to sit and point fingers at my generation and be like, they don't want to listen, they don't want to learn. They, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to sit here and be like, we're better than you or you're anything like that. I'm not trying to point fingers, but from what I've seen and what I've experienced, the generation older than me is really quick and easy to point at me and say, you're lazy, you're this, you're useful, you're helpless, all that, but don't want to admit that because you reached 50, you no longer have to grow up. I mean, seriously, you want to live to be 100, but you only want to grow up for 50 years, and then the next 50 years you get to party or something, but you go to bed at 9 o'clock. So I don't, I mean, I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. So then you wonder why, like, there's all this, because there's no, there's no teaching. There's no turning around and helping out the generation behind you. And there's also, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll defend the generation that came before me. There's a lot of disrespect in my generation where we don't want to take the advice or we don't want to take the knowledge because we feel like we know better because we're, we know how to use computers and you don't, so we're smarter than you. I mean, it cracks me up because pastor all the time be like, Freddie, the Wi-Fi is not working. I'm like, pastor, is the Wi-Fi on? <coughs> no. Just turn it on, pastor. There you go. Right? And like, a lo- I see these things on like the internet and it's like when you have to help your parents, you know, like Google search and stuff. And it cracks me up because like I FaceTimed my parents when we were in New York and they like, my dad didn't know how to like hold the phone right. So it like really made me laugh because I was like, dang, that's heck of true. I never like really had that experience. But at the same time, I was like, I, I still ask them for advice. I still, and I don't disvalue their advice or discredit their advice. I, you know, a lot of times I won't accept it at first, but I'll still ask them for it because I know they're right. Because when they do tell me, even though I don't ask for it, because they have a responsibility to me as a parent to teach me what's right, even though I'm 24 years old, and it doesn't matter. They're still going to have to tell me what's right and what's wrong because they've been alive at least twice as long as I have. Sorry, I didn't mean to put your age out there. But anyways, and the, uh, the last definition was have faith or confidence. And then faith is a really big word when it comes to Christians because we throw it out like we have all this faith in the world. But Vanessa was talking, about, like right at the end, she was talking about how everything could be falling apart, but we have this foundation. And for some of us that's true, and for a lot of us it's not. We should have a foundation, but we don't because we don't establish ourselves on the word of God. That's what the Bible tells us to do, is establish yourself on the word of God. And it said, it, and it, not only that, but it says, like, delight yourself in the, the Lord, and he'll establish your goings. Like, so, it, I mean, you have to just, like, delight yourself in God. You don't even, there's not, and he establishes it. And we somehow think, no, I have to do it. I have to do all this stuff. There's so much that I have to do. 
And it's really not that complicated. And so we've, we've learned here, and hopefully on your own, that God is moved by our faith. It's not anything we do. It's not how, how much we help out at church. It's not how much we pray, how much we praise and worship. It's none of that. It's our faith. And faith is your trust in him to fulfill his word. Like that's, that's it's as simple as that. You trust God to be God, but we don't. And we really try to compare him to everyone else in our life. We try to compare him to how your parents will say, yeah, I promise to take you here, and then they don't, so then we feel like God's not gonna do, do he's gonna do the same thing to us. I, I promise to deliver you. I pro- and then we're like, no, you're not. You're not gonna do it. And it was, I don't know, it was just something that just every time the message was coming out, no matter what they, like whoever was up here was talking about, it was trust in me, trust in my word. Like that's what I kept hearing. That's what I kept, and then all the scriptures I kept finding. And there's a lot of scriptures that talk about trust. And almost every single one of them relates to trusting in God and like not trusting in anything but him. It doesn't say trust in the church. It doesn't say trust in pastor. Trust in your tithe, trust in your works, trust in your anything but that. It's trust in God. And if you go to Psalms 20, verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They're, they were going to go into battle, and they're talking about other people rely on what they have with them, what their strength is, what their weapons are, all that. That's what they trust in, right? I mean, I would probably trust in that too. If I was in war, I'd be like, I'm going to trust this gun is going to work because I'm really not trying to die right? But how many of you have seen that movie like Hacksaw Ridge, right? And he didn't want to kill anyone. He, it was against his, his belief. And he went up there and he saved lives and he rescued everyone and his trust was in God. And what, you know, it's crazy. His prayer was, please God, let me get one more. Like, oh man, I'm kind of getting emotional. I never did that before. <laughs> but it, we miss that though. We miss that. We think that that's just a really nice thing to say or a really brave thing to say, but his, de- his, his focus was, God, let me do your work. Let me save your people, not save me. It wasn't God, help save me, protect me. It was let, let me get one more. God, let me get one more. And we really miss that. Our prayers are so selfish. We think that, and then we get disappointed in God when he doesn't answer it, when it never said in his word that he would give us those things. It doesn't say to pray for riches and blessings and all this kind of stuff. It says pray for the harvest. It says pray for the mission. Pray for the the church and the body. And pray that people will get saved and see the light. That's what it says to pray for, but we don't pray for that. And then here's what's funny. What cracks me up is our prayers don't get answered, but then we're so quick to want to pray for someone else. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to let you pray for me unless I trust you, unless I see that God's moving in your life. I've had people come up to me on the street, let me pray for you. No, thanks. And I've had people ask me, why didn't you? Uh, because I don't know his faith. I don't know his spiritual standing. And I, and I didn't get an unctioning, let this man pray for you. If I got that, I would have done it. But I didn't get that, so I'm not going to do it. And that's really hard for people to understand because they think like it's dismissive. It thinks like you're causing dissension and all this kind of stuff because they're not, they don't have the word. They've just heard someone else say the word. And then they pervert it through their mind. They don't look at it spiritually. We, we hear the word and things sound good and then we line it up with like what our eyes see. When we, you know what, go to, I shouldn't have written my notes because it's really hard for me to read my writing, but go to John 10, 27. And actually, I'm sorry, you know what, Matthew 14, 25 through 33, let's go there. And this is when Jesus comes out and walks on the water and he calls Peter out of the boat. And let's, let's read that. Let's read that. And in the fourth watch between 3 and 6 a.m. of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Isn't that just like us? Who's up between 3 and 6 a.m.? I guarantee you, me and pastor's hands are going to be the only ones up in here. I guarantee you. Oh, Dar, too. Cause yeah, because Dar's on the night shift. <laughs> but no, but we're sleeping. That's comfort time, right? But that's when Jesus came knocking between 3 and 6. That's when Jesus showed up. Jesus, here's what's funny. Jesus w- was with them, and he told them, go ahead of me. I'm going to go up and pray. Right? And then they're going from one side of the sea to the other. Now, there was like only boats and horses back then. 
So it's not like Jesus could just like hop on, you know, like southwest and just fly across the, the sea real quick and meet them on the other side. Like he would have had to take a boat or something. Like, but he walks across the water to meet them. And it says, and when the, disi- the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. His own disciples didn't even recognize him. Sound familiar? God's word is being spoken and we don't recognize it. I mean, the Bible says, if you've seen one of my children, then you've seen me. Because they were looking for signs and wonders and they were like, oh, we want to see that, we want to see. And they're like, if you've seen my children they've did, and they've done my work, then you've seen me. And I, every Sunday, someone pastors up here and we should see God through him. We should see what, the word of God is saying and understand that, but we don't because we're just so focused on everything else. We try and filter the word of God through so many different lenses instead of filtering everything else through the word of God. We have it so backwards, like we really do. And it says, and they screamed out with fright, but instantly he spoke to them saying, take courage, I am. He's saying, it's me. He hasn't calmed down. Like if we put it in like, Modern language, that's what he'd say. He'd be like, chill, it's me, relax. He says, stop being afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, it's funny because he just said it's me, and he's still gonna be like, well, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. Here's what's, what, what we don't, we'll put God to the test, right? And then he'll do it. And he says, okay, come. Oh, that didn't really sound like God. He said, if it's you, tell me to come. Okay, come. Mm, no, nah, I'm good. I'll stay here. Like, we don't fulfill our end of the bargain. So many times, we don't do what we're supposed to be doing. We get so close to doing it. And it's really frustrating sometimes, too, because there's, like, so many things that, like, don't get done in the church because people, like, only get to the finish line, but never cross the finish line. I mean, I myself have been guilty of that. I've done it. Pastors ask me to do things, and I've kind of done it, or I've done it, like, at the last minute, and then, like, I see how it could have been better if I had actually been committed to what he asked me to do or done it wholeheartedly, and then I have to deal with that. But I don't beat myself up too much about it. I learn from it. I don't sit there and start wallowing in guilt, but I don't also keep continuing to make the same mistake. That's what some of us do. We wallow in guilt and continue to make the same mistake and complain about it. God, why aren't you moving in my life? You're not doing anything. You're not helping yourself. And walked on the water and he came towards Jesus. But when he perceived and felt the strong wind, the the King James Version says he saw the wind. And we can't see the wind. And we really talk about this a lot. We talk about how you can't see the, you know, we've all read the scripture and it's like, well, you can't see the wind we're really good at making things up in our mind a lot bigger than they really are to, to give us an excuse to stop trusting God. We really turn really small situations into really big end-of-the-world problems that are like, I, can't just, I just can't trust God. It's just too much right now. I have too much going on. That is the exact moment you need to trust God and only trust God and do nothing else but that. But we turn to everything else. We go to, it's, you know, it's funny. We go on Facebook our post is probably this long and like this much of it is all the problem and this much is it, but I'm trusting God. (laughs) Like, no, you're not. I had to hit more on the post in order to see that you said, but I'm trusting God. Like, if you're going to post anything, just be like, I'm trusting God. Like, that's it. Like, that's all you need to post. You don't need to post the problem because then you got to, and then you complain. Everyone's all in my business. Stop telling it to everyone. Everyone, Everyone's so nosy. Everyone's always asking what's wrong with me. Well, stop complaining all the time. Just start rejoicing and, be, and praising God and thanking him for the blessings, thanking for how he's got you this far, thanking for how he's kept you, thanking for how he's prospered, prospered you. But we really don't do that. We, I, I don't know. We, I, I always say this, but we really do overcomplicate God. Like we, I mean, seriously, his name's three letters long. It's not that complicated. It's one syllable. It's God, like that God. I mean, some of us even say it like, God, gas prices are up again. I mean, we just throw it into everything. Some, oh, Jesus, right? We just throw it in. I mean, some, we don't, it's like blinking. We say it so much, it's like, we don't really think about it. it, but we don't know the power of it and we don't say it with the power and the authority. I talked about that last time. There's power in the name of Jesus and we don't say it and approach situations like that. We really just like, 
Use it to complain like God's cursing us or something. Mm, no, sorry, he's not. And yeah, uh, he's not, okay? He's not. You b- took yourself out from under his covering and you need to come back under his covering and stop taking yourself out and then complaining about why he's not, like, he's not gonna chase after you. He will wait for you to come back and welcome you with open arms, but he's not gonna chase after you because if you don't want him, then you don't want him. He's, and he, I've seen so many people run and try and run, and they honestly, something, like the spirit draws them back, but that spirit that when they first got touched, it never left them. Like when you get touched by God, you can't ever deny that it happened. You, like I don't care how much you try and do to erase that from you. It's never going to happen. That mark is permanent. That stain on your heart and your spirit is permanent. It's always going to be there. You're never going to be able to turn from it, ever. I don't care. Like in your last breath, you're going to be like, oh God, I'm sorry, and mean it. You're going to call out to him and mean it. Like, and I, we, have, we really don't, like even our worst days are way better than some people's in like other countries. And we really do think we have it terrible. Like we think it's so bad. Like, we think, oh, because, you know, I read this thing. If you have no debts and $10 in your pocket, you are richer than like 25% of America. And then I was like, dang, that's just America. Imagine other countries, probably richer than the whole country. You walk over there with 10 bucks and no debt. You're like, I am now president of this country. Like, you know what I mean? I was thinking that. I was like, dang, I should maybe try that. You know what I mean? Go somewhere. I, I don't own a country. I'd be down with that. But then I, then I started thinking, I was like, that's too much responsibility. I don't. I don't want to hear so many people come to me with their problems. and all. I mean, that's why you should pray for our leaders, whether you like them or not. Because, I mean, I guarantee you, they probably didn't know what they were getting into, even though they think they know what they're getting into. And it can tear someone up. I mean, just imagine if you were in charge of, like, the free nation. You'd probably make some dumb idea- make mistakes, too. I mean, hopefully you're not dumb going in, but... That's a different story. But I'm just saying, I mean, it could make you dumb. I mean, you just got, I'm, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep going. I'll, I'm going to, no, thank you. <laughs> but we, you know, we sing a song on Sunday too, and Nyla sings it, uh, I Will Trust in You, right? And there's another song that that artist has that basically says, I actually like it more. It basically says the same thing, but she doesn't actually say trust, um, but it talks about how no matter what happens, even if God's not doing what I want him to do, I'm going to trust in God. Even if it seems like everything's falling apart around me, I'm going to trust in God. Even if it seems like all hell is breaking loose and like the devil's only coming after me, I'm going to trust in God. And I think one of the like greatest examples of trusting God is Daniel when he got thrown in the lion's den because he was so confident. Like there, there was never any doubt in his mind that he wouldn't make it out of that situation. That, and not only that, but that he wouldn't, like not only did he make it out of that situation, but he was, like God conquered that situation for him. Like he could have just like been thrown in the lion's den and then like, you know, they could have just like, not been hungry that day, but it says that God shut the mouths of the lions. Like, I don't, I've never seen, I've watched National Geographic a million times, and the lions sit there like this. <laughs> like, all the, they sit there like that. I've never seen a lion without his mouth, with, with his mouth closed, ever, especially when he looks at anything moving. And, mm, you know what I mean? Like, Their eyes get wide. I mean, that's free food. You know what I mean? Especially, you got a whole den down there. It's not like they're hunting or anything. It's in the dark. It's like, ooh, that smells fresh. That doesn't smell like a dead deer or whatever they threw in there. That smells alive. You know what I mean? Like, but it shut the mouths of the lions. Like, God, I'm sorry. God shut the mouths of the lions. And his faith impacted other people. You see what I'm saying? Like, his trust in God, your trust in God should be impacting someone else. If you're not impacting other people, you're not trusting God. It's that simple. 
It's really that simple. You can claim to be a Christian. You can come to church. You can read your Bible. You can share the live stream. I don't care. It doesn't mean you trust God. I mean, I, you know, I told pastor I had this problem because I didn't want to share my live stream because I didn't want to seem like I was boasting on myself or self-promoting or anything like that. But I got an unctioning in my spirit and said, share this. And when I did, I had friends who I've talked to about God so many times that never seemed to really care about it. They liked it and they shared it. And I was like, ooh, dang, hallelujah. I was like, I mean, because here's the thing. I can talk to them about God all I want, but until I show them that I'm serious about it, and I did, but maybe I did, didn't think I was serious enough. But I showed them, look, I'm not just saying this. I'm, I'm not, it's not just something I occasionally say, I occasionally do. It's like this is something I believe. This is something that I choose to live my life by. And they saw the sincerity in that, and they saw, and, and it wasn't in me, but they saw the truth that I was saying. And they understood that it wasn't me up here. You know what I mean? Because that's what's great. Like, I really don't believe they saw Freddie talking. They saw the word of God coming out. And then after, they were like, oh, dang, it was Freddie. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I just thought it was really cool. And, like, that was, that was my expectation, honestly, was someone was going to, Someone who hasn't received the message before is going to receive the message. That was my prayer when I posted it. God, let this impact someone that has never been impacted by this before. And God answered that prayer. And it wasn't, God, don't let me look like an idiot. You know what I mean? Like, because I make myself like, like, look like an idiot all the time, like whether it's for God or not. So I'm not really concerned about looking like an idiot. I mean, I have tape on my glasses right now <laughs> because they broke. And insurance doesn't exist in California for glasses. And I tried like three different things to glue it together so you wouldn't see tape, but I still had to put tape on there. And pastor was like, you just got to look like a nerd, huh? And I was like, yep, you know it. I mean, I'm serious. Like, there's, it's funny because like we'll be out somewhere and someone will literally be like, oh, I bet you Freddie would wear that. And it's something that looks ridiculous. It's like, it's like a jacket that was made out of like a life raft or something. Like, so, like out of a traffic cone, but I bet you Freddie would wear that. And I guarantee you, I'd be like, yeah, I bet you I'd wear that too. I, one time, I went to the thrift store. This is kind of off topic, but I went to the thrift store, and I wanted to get these pants, and they were like metallic denim, and they were like too long, and I was like, ooh, I could, I was talking to myself out loud in the dressing room. I didn't realize it. I was like, ooh, I could hem these. These would look nice. And I walked out, and this lady was like, they suit you. <laughs> she didn't even know me. She, they suit you. And I was like, dang, thank you. But see, when you have trust in God, you have confidence in yourself to do stuff like that. And that can open the door because I guarantee you if I went in there trying to look cool or trying to look funny wearing metallic pants, I'd just look like a fool and they'd be like, God, this guy's annoying and ruining my shopping experience. But I didn't do that. And a lot of us, like, we really do that with God. We try, like, to promote God way too hard. Like, you don't need to promote God. You need to just live God. Like, it's, you know, it's great, like, if you think about like really successful companies, they don't build like products, they build like experiences, right? I mean like Apple, like with iPhones, like they come out with one every year, they just came out with like two in one year this time, and they, like your old phone is like, it, it's not really that much different. I mean, to me, I'm like, oh, that's heck of tight, like it's cool, like I'm all getting, and then I'm like, it's really not that much better. But like I get like moved at first. And then I'm like, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do this. Don't be persuaded, right? But it's funny because if you, like, you're either an iPhone user or any other phone. Right. Like, there's no, like, oh, I'm in, th it's like, you either have an iPhone or you don't. If you don't have an iPhone, everyone's like, <laughs> like, they don't like you, right? They're like, I can't send you cool emojis and stuff. Like, you don't get them. And, like, all this kind of stuff, right? Like, you want to be, like, in the club. And, like, you don't have to do anything but like have an iPhone and like they build an experience and like you create an experience and you live like a iPhone lifestyle, right? Okay, so let me bring this back to God. Like you don't, shouldn't have to go around and be like yelling Jesus and God and all this everywhere and like showing your Bible to everyone. It should just be like radiating off of you. It should just see like, I bet you that guy has Jesus in his life. I bet you that guy is a Christian. And it shouldn't be, I bet you that guy's a Christian because he's a weirdo. It should be like, 
I bet you, I, let me, I bet you that guy's like a real Christian. Because like that's what I, that, that's, it's funny, growing up in this church, I love it. And then at times it's hard for me to understand because I, I, didn't, I didn't come to church at this age. So and there wasn't like a period of my life where I wasn't in church. You know what I mean? Like I grew up in this church. And thank God for that, there wasn't like a bunch of other churches to like taint my image or anything like that of what church and God is. I'm really blessed and grateful that I grew up in this church. And so it's really hard for me sometimes to understand people who can look at this and our church or what we do or other churches like it that do the same thing, that stand for what we stand for and like be so against it. And then at the same time, I'm like, no, I do get it because they're hurt because they trusted the man of God and the, God, the man of God didn't lead them to trust God. Like, and that's what pastors always done. It's so funny because every time I've always felt like I need a pastor the most, he literally wasn't around. Like when I felt like, oh, let me call pastor, straight to voicemail. Like, any other time, like, I could call him and be like, hey, pastor, can you do this? And whatever. But, or anyone. Like, Charlie's done the same thing to me. I'm like, usually I can call Charlie, and then I'll call him, and, it, like, he won't answer. And sometimes I guarantee you it's on purpose. It's, I guarantee you it's on purpose. <laughs> oh, Freddie, and ignore. Right? I guarantee you. Because they probably got an unction in their spirit, don't answer that phone. And, and, I've had the same unctioning when people have called me. And then I've talked to them the next day. And I'd be like, oh, hey, I saw, I saw you call me. What's up? And then they talk to me like, and I, it's happened twice. They've called me and they're like, I really felt like I needed to just vent and da, 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 da. And I didn't have anyone else. And I felt like you could help me. And then I remembered the times that you've told me that I'm not going to be able to help you. There's going to be times that I'm not going to answer the phone. I'm not going to be able to be there for you, and you're going to have to learn to trust God because if you're really going to claim that you want to be a Christian, then that's who you have to turn to. And, like, that's what stuck with them. But, see, a lot of people won't make that stand because they want to be someone's friend so bad. They can't tell them, no, I'm not going to help you sometimes. You have to do it on your own. You have to trust God. You have to believe in God. And the only way that someone can say that is if they fully trust in God. Because you wouldn't tell someone, oh, I, this friend is reliable if you knew they weren't reliable. Right? Like, you wouldn't, unless you're just a terrible friend to someone. And please don't do that. Like, if you know someone's not reliable, don't tell someone else they're reliable. Don't lie, try and make them feel better or look good or whatever. Like, they're not reliable. But God is always reliable. And you should have that faith and confidence in him to trust him and to be able to impart that to someone else. And that can change someone's life because there's going to be, every person is going to fail someone, but God is never going to fail you, ever. God has never failed me, ever. Even in the time, it's, you know what's so great about him? His grace and his mercy, because there's times when we turn our back on him and he'll still come through. He'll still keep his hedge of protection over us because he's not going to give up on us. And he's not going to let you go out like that because you are a child of God. You are called to be greater than what you are right now. Even if you feel like you're the greatest you're ever going to be, you're called to be greater than that. You're called to be more than that. You're called to be more, 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 just more. You're just called to be more. And he doesn't want you to go out with a whimper. I saw this movie last night. It was crazy. It was about these guys. They, it was on a, it was up in Wyoming. It was on an Indian reservation. And there was these two girls who got like kidnapped and murdered and then, there was a, a hunter, and the FBI agent comes, and she was like, what do you do? He's like, well, I hunt animals. I'm part of, like, the wildlife preserve. I keep the predators away from the livestock and all that. She's like, you want to help me hunt someone? And I was like, oh, that's tight. Right? I was all into it. And it was so cool because he was fr his, his daughter actually was murdered, and his friend is the, the girl in the beginning who gets murdered. So they, they share that bond that their children were taken away from them. And he says, I don't care who it is. He says, if you find him, you take him out, right? And so at the end of the movie, he does take him out, and he comes in. And he says, how did he go? And he said, with a whimper. And I was like, ooh, that's true. Like, he, ooh, he, didn't even, he didn't even kill him. Like, the guy just, like, oh, he died a terrible death. I felt so bad for him. But then I was like, no, nah, he deserved it. He was a, but, like, you know, I still felt bad because I was like, I'm not, like, a terrible person. But, you know, I don't like seeing people die, but sometimes I'm like, yeah, they deserved it. But... It's, I don't, then I don't like saying that because I'm like, that sounds bad. Like, I talk about the love of God and I'm like, yeah, they deserve to die. You know what I mean? Like, I think about it and then I'm like, nah, it's true. There's, there's some people. It wasn't like them necessarily that they deserve to die. You know what I mean? Anyways, 
I don't want to get into that. That's not what, but it was, and I thought about it, and I was like, man, I don't want to go out with a whimper. You know what I mean? And I don't want someone to look at me and be like, oh, he went out with a whimper. And it's not, I want to have some big extravagant thing or, well, I do. I've talked about it before. But, like, I don't want someone to look back and be like, oh, he had so much potential. You know what I mean? Like, I've had high school teachers tell me that. They're like, Freddie, you're so smart, but you talk too much. Like, you have so much potential, but you fool around too much. You have so much potential, but you always want to, like, make jokes and everything. I was like, well, you could be more interesting. <laughs> like, I try and blame them, right? But then I have to think about it. I'm like, that's true. I, then I thought, like, really, after I graduated high school, I was like, I wonder how many people didn't learn because of me. Like, how many people didn't learn something that day and probably got a question wrong on a test because I wanted to be funny? Like, I really thought about that. And I was like, dang, that's mature, right? <laughs> like, I was like, I was all proud of myself. But I was, it, I, I don't know. Coming here, I can't not have a sense of responsibility to other people. And I think that if you really are living a Christian lifestyle and trusting God, you have a sense of responsibility to other people. And you have a sense of responsibility that, you want to see them saved. You want to see lives changed. You want to see people grow in the Lord. You want to see people come to the Lord and be restored and be fulfilled and be made whole and be made new and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of us don't because we, like I said before, our prayers are so selfish. Our thoughts are so selfish. Our thoughts are always, what can God do for me? How can God bless me? How can God make me greater? How can God do this for me and that for me? And not, how can God use me? How can God be shown through me? How can I impact someone how can God impact someone through me? How can I use what I'm interested in or what my gift is or whatever to change someone else's life, to impact someone, to touch someone, to be there for someone, to show someone what a true Christian is, what God is, to who God is. Not just what, like, not just what God is, who God is. Because like I said, God is a person. You have to show someone who God is. And they should see God in you all the time. And you have to always be on point and always be aware and always be ready. That's why the Bible says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Because, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's why it's not, you shouldn't just get word knowledge like we've talked about. You shouldn't just be able to memorize the scriptures. You should have the scripture in your heart. It should mean something to you. It should change your life. It should change the way you live. It shouldn't just be like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That, da, 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 da. No, I don't want you to quote it to me. What does it mean? How did that change your life? How did that take, you were going down this way. How did it make you go whoop? How did that scripture then make you go whoop and whoop? Like your life should never be like this. I mean, it's called the straight and narrow, like, uh, yeah, you, you know, okay. But I'm just saying, like, here's the thing. Here's what I learned with God. If you are going in one direction for too long, you missed your turn. And you know why I know that? Because pastor does that all the time. Like, I bet you so many people were surprised that the trees got cut down. Like, I wasn't surprised. Not because, like, I knew it was coming or anything, but I was just like, it's church. Like, I guarantee you next week we're going to come in and we're going to have like blue lights or there's going to be like actual birds flying around or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> like something going on. But it's, and it's, here's the thing. It's all for a purpose, but we get so caught up in like, oh, the walls are trees now. Like we all, like, you didn't care. You didn't care before it went up. Like you didn't, buy, like, you know, it's funny. Like we'll complain about how the church looks, but if there's like a piece of trash outside, we won't pick it up. Like we really won't. Like, I don't care how small it is. We won't pick it up. We'll be like, well, it seems to not be there when I come back on Wednesday, so someone must pick it up. <laughs> well, yeah, that someone was probably me or someone else who was like, oh, trash. Let me not let this affect someone's or, or perception of the house of God. Because that's how I look at it. It's not just like, oh, it's church. Because I guarantee, I, trust me, I keep this place cleaner than I keep my room, I keep the car, I keep anything else. This place, I keep way cleaner than anything else I own or anything else I'm involved in. It doesn't matter. I keep it way clean. You can ask my parents. Okay. I'm like, sometimes I'll just sleep downstairs because my room is way too messy. I'm like, I can't even go in there. I'm just sleeping downstairs. I'm going to live downstairs for a week. I'm good. I'll go in there and change, but I can't clean the room. It's overwhelming. Like, I'm serious. You can ask them. It's true. But here, I can't do that because I've been taught that you respect the house of God. And it's not just the building, but you come in here and you have a reverence for it. Like, from a young age, don't run in church. And then take off running. Don't run in church. Take off running. Don't run in church. And then it was, and it wasn't just don't run in church. It was, this is why we don't run in church. 
because it's not a house, it's not a, it's not a place for playing around, for goofing around, for having fun in that sense. You can have fun in the Lord. You can run around if you get overtaken by the Holy Spirit because no one's going to stop you then. But if you're running around just because you're fooling around and goofing off and not paying attention to what's going on here, you're bringing in a different type of spirit. I'm not saying you guys are running around or anything like that, but we do other things. I mean, we'll text. Well, I mean, here's what's, you know what's funny? People who get here early but don't talk to anyone when they get here. I mean, I get here early. Pastor talks about getting here early. It's so important. Yeah, but what do you do when you get here? Do you get here early and then sit in your car? Or do you get here early and then, like, get on your phone and, like, literally people will sit in the row behind you, and I know you hear them sit down because you'll literally, you'll be on your phone and you'll, and then get on your phone more because it's not the person you know. It's not someone you usually associate with. I mean, I'm telling you, I, that's why so many people left early on Sunday. As soon as the food was over, that's why so many people left because you didn't have a heart for what was going on here. And you can think that it's not important. You can think that it doesn't matter, but it does. Because we're all God's children. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you've done. And it says, because the Bible says that in, without him, we're all sinners. Without him, we are not righteous, but he makes us righteous. And that's what it says, is it, he, we were sinners and now we're righteous. It doesn't say we were white sinners, we were black sinners, we were Asian. It doesn't say that. It says we were sinners. It, there is no... And it, the Bible, it, it's in, that, in that same passage, it says Jews and Greeks because that's just like what the demographic was in that area. And people can try and be like, okay, well, then it's just talking about Jews and Greeks. No, it's not. What they were trying to say is that the Jews lived over here, the Greeks lived over here, and they separated themselves because of their race and because of their religion and all that kind of stuff, and God didn't call us to do that. And when you don't trust God's word, you think that when pastor's up here talking about that kind of stuff, or I'm up here talking about it, or you see other people talking about it, you think that they're controversial, you think that they're crazy, you think that they don't know what they're talking about, and they have some type of agenda, and they don't. You have an agenda. Comfort. And it's not time, it's not called to be comfortable. If you look around you and turn on the news, the freeway was shut down all day today because there was a police holdup because some guy, there was, you know, some standoff going on. And you honestly like have the audacity to think that your life is so much more important than other people's like imagine the people that got stopped right in front they suspected that that guy had a weapon of some kind what if it was some type of machine gun and he just started like you can't go anywhere you're stuck in your car and you just happen to be the one who's like right in the front of the line and you have to die because of that like that doesn't make any sense but we really think our lives are so hard that we can't trust god with the simplest things and we don't trust god when he gives us a calling and tells us to do something we question it we fight it and we don't want it and we reject it and we get angry with god we leave the church we get angry with other people and we just sit in our little corner sit in our little shell and push everyone away and say no one loves us say no one cares about us and I've done that, and it's not true. I got myself kicked out of youth, and then I said, because they didn't come apologize to me, they didn't care about me, why should I go back? I got myself kicked out of youth. You didn't hear what I said. I got myself kicked out of youth, and then said, because they didn't come apologize to me, I said, why should I go back? And I guarantee you that there was people in that youth group who could have used me and needed me if I had been where I was supposed to be and done what I was supposed to be doing. I guarantee it because I've seen them leave. And I saw who it was. I knew who it was. So don't tell me that this isn't important. You can sit there and get mad and rejected and all you, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm talking to the people online then because at least they're tuned in. <laughs> they made a conscious effort to be here even though they couldn't be here. And some of us show up and we don't really want to be here. You know, I mean, we have it online. You could stay home. You don't have to come. And, and the Spirit called you here for a reason. And you were smart enough to answer that and come but then you want to sit here in your resistance and fight it and you bring that resistance in here and it affects other people you think spirits don't do that and they do and we, i mean the world likes to talk about auras and stuff right and it like radiates away from you well yeah your negative energy like you know it's funny you can smell someone who stinks more than you can smell someone who smells good roses you have to get right here to smell but trash you can smell from like down the block Sometimes it stinks in here. <laughs> and it's not B.O. <laughs> Trust me, it is not. But unless you're spiritual, you don't understand that. And I guarantee you, you get mad at me. I don't care. I mean, I really don't. I've gotten mad at Pastor so many times. He was like, you'll get over it. <laughs> and I was like, not this time I won't. You just wait. I'm not going to get over it. I'm going to be mad at you, and you're going to regret it. 
I mean, I never said that out loud, but I thought it. I wasn't bold enough to say it out loud. I'm bold to say things, but not that. I was, you know why? Because my spirit checked me. It was like, don't say that. Don't disrespect the man of God like that. Don't disrespect what he's saying. You know he's right. That's why you're angry. Because we get angry when someone's right. Like, we don't get angry when someone's wrong. We're just like, whatever, you're wrong. But when someone's right about us, we get mad because it hurts. It hits home. And here's the thing. I got to wrap up with this. When you trust God, you can believe that you're going to get, I don't want to say offended, but you're going to get ruffled. You're going to get your feathers ruffled. And if it's not doing that, like Pastor said before, then there's something wrong with the word that's being preached. And because, look, we had our chance for a life of, well, not we had our chance, but Adam and Eve screwed that up. But there was a chance for life without problems, without sin, without all that. But guess what? It's gone. So we have that. So instead of sitting here whining and complaining about it, we have to deal with it. And what the Bible says is you were made for this time. So as bad as things are, you have to realize that you are honestly probably stronger than most of the people that have come before you. Because things are going to progress. The Bible talks about that. The world is going to progressively get worse. And for order to someone to handle something that's worse, you have to be better than what came before, right? Like stains get worse. That's why they come out with like new and improved soap, right? You're the new and improved soap. Like you're the brighter light bulb. Like LEDs are brighter than like old incandescent light bulbs, right? Like, and we're supposed to be the light of the world. So like be an LED or like, you know, let someone see the G-O-D in you. Just saying, thank you.